and you had paper scripts, and you would memorize, if you could, you'd memorize one page of your script, and try to get all those cues in, and then redo what you had to redo. At least that's the way it worked where I was. Um, so that's a huge uh, difference than the way it is now. I don't know, there was no real internet back when we started. Like you, if you wanted to download a summary of an episode, there was no such thing. Uh, if you wanted to use MapQuest, yeah, yeah. Ask yeah. Your best <laughs> and write it down uh, or print it out. The what else? It was so different back then. Um, the most noticeable difference, and the thing I'm actually the most excited about these days, is that when we were first working in like 1997 on this stuff. There was just this whole entire universe of anime that hadn't been dubbed, and so then we kind of, over time, reached a singularity where all of it had been dubbed, and then we're kind of moving forward to dubbing things as they're coming out. And the coolest thing is the involvement that the, the Japanese clients, uh, the Japanese licensors have with all the companies now. They're really involved in casting, and you, really, they, you see them at events now. Back in the day, it's just, I don't think I ever met a Japanese person until it was like 2004. Because I live in Texas, no Japanese people are there. Um, <laughs> but it was, it's really exciting now to know that somebody who's actually creating this show gets to hear your voice and approve it, and it's pretty neat. Yeah. I think anime popularity has always been there, you know, wax and wanes and peaks and valleys and stuff, and now it's like bigger than ever. It's so mainstream that we can go to a Comic-Con type event and people from TV shows and movies are go, how do I get into anime? <laughs> it's like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. I never thought that it would get even more popular as time went on. I thought we're, we're this little, little niche sort of, sort of world and now there's crossover. There used to be Comic-Cons, then there's Anime-Cons. And now you see anime people cosplaying at Comic-Cons and vice versa. And I think it's awesome to see the crossover, and so many more families now. People that grew up listening to shows that we're on are now growing up having kids of their own. They're all bringing their whole families and everyone's cosplaying together. When I think we started, it was mostly teenage girls. And yes. just, you know, mostly just, just really young, really young, but now they're growing up and now they're bringing their whole family, so. See I remember a lot of young people, but that's because half the time we were like at a Barnes and Noble uh, signing, <laughs> like, <laughs> signing with the Dragon Ball Z Hummer or whatever, we'd, we'd fly out to like Rooster Crude, Arkansas, and we'd stay in a Quality Inn and then- Where in Arkansas? <laughs> Rooster Crude? Rooster Crude, Arkansas. Rooster so Crude. It's not an actual place. Uh, <laughs> it might be, actually, but the- It should be. It was a lot different. I mean, the panels back then were really funny because, you know, how many of you watched the, like, the original dub of Dragon Ball, like the original dub? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. so you may be, um, this might be a shock to you, but it was not a very accurate portrayal of Dragon Ball. <laughs> I know, this might be the first time you're hearing this, but um, yeah, and people, especially in the early anime uh, convention days, they didn't like that very much, especially like real hardcore otaku that had already purchased all of the episodes of Dragon Ball long before I could get them. and. Uh, all the panels would only have like 20 people in them, and they uh, raise their hand. I go, "Yes, you." And they go, "Why'd you guys change the music?" I'm like, "It's not my fault, man." I mean, Why'd you guys change the scripts? I'm like, "I don't know. We're English. Like, we live in Texas. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know why I'm here." Uh, but it, and and then uh, cosplay was really confusing back then, and they'd have us uh, judge cosplay contests, and I'd be like, wow, that's really cool. I have no idea what any of this stuff is. <laughs> and now it's changed. Now I actually know what most of it is, and I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> that's Bluey, right? <laughs> which, which one? The yellow one. Oh. <laughs> it's actually that makes logical sense. <laughs> That's a really good panel, you guys. Thank you. No, so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just, I, I was really amused by that. Um, no, so you guys, should let the awkward sit, because that's the best. <laughs> let that awkward sit. I'm, I'm here to avoid that. I, that or maybe I'm not doing my job well. <laughs> um, so you guys have done a very, very wide range of roles. Um, so I won't ask you about any particular role, but is there any particular types of roles that you enjoy doing? You know, in anime and in voiceover, there's like, you know, you have kind of the Ikemen characters that are really like flower boy types, and then you also have like the really burly kind of guys. Um, 
anything, any kind of character that like speaks to you that you really enjoy doing more than others? I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough recently to have gotten cast as a few that are just really, really complicated and twisty, and um, that the mysteriousness, the layers that that's the most appealing to me as an actor. Uh, it's just a lot to, to grab onto and work with. Oh man, uh, I get cast as almost the same thing on everything, so... <laughs> there have been a couple of times when I've been cast against stuff, like I Am A and Fruits Basket and uh, Kristoff and Yuri on Ice and stuff, it's yeah. fun. Oh, but, you know, when you, it, I'm sure as many of you, you're allowed to admit it in here, it's a safe space, and probably listen to the, you know, the subtitled versions of these things. Uh, there only seem to be about four type of Japanese voices. There's like the, the kid voice, which I can't even impersonate. And then there's the kind of the mysterious bad guy voice. I have no, I don't speak Japanese. I'm sorry. And then, uh, but I always play the guys like, That's the guy I do. That's the one I'm always cast at. <laughs> I think I play the guys that are voiced by women a lot. Yes. I like playing goofy, cartoonish things because that's what I wanted to do since I was a kid. I want to voice cartoons. I want to do Looney Tunes, that kind of thing. But I also appreciate stuff where you know directors or casting people think outside the box and it's like, let's try Kyle on this kind of role. So going from Gohan to like Karasu in the Dark Tournament saga, yeah. the Haka show, uh, that's like way different. And I ended up doing that same voice for Eisen and Bleach years later. So it's like, this is cool. So things, things that sonically are very, very different. I, li I like that challenge. I, I kind of like them all. I think it just depends on the character and the story. You know, I, I'm not super picky. It's nice to change things up too. Yeah, I feel is. like we've all been typecast for chunks of our careers and then like to to suddenly get something different feels really refreshing. Yeah. Uh, so we are going to start transitioning into our Q&A for the audience. If you guys want to start lining up, feel free. But I do have um, just one more question that I wanted to ask. This has been something really interesting um, that we've got some really interesting answers for in some of the other um, VA panels. What is the most obscure voice acting job that you've done? So for example, Adam MacArthur is the voice of Geek Squad. Like literally, if you call Geek, or well, not anymore, but he was the old voice if you called, like, he was the one who answers. Do you guys, uh, and that's not like necessarily what you have to say, but something that maybe like most people don't know that you want to share. I am the voice of Elvis for some weird little one-off small town Elvis museum. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm in like exhibits and stuff. Hey baby, what do you want me to do? Give me a peanut butter banana sandwich, man. It's not on there anymore, but they used to have these trams at the DFW airport, and I did the voice of those for a while. Uh, I did the movie phone voice for a period of time, and uh, I know some of you guys don't know what that is, but before the internet, you, you wanted to know what time a movie started, you had to call someone, and they would say, thank you for calling movie phone. And uh, that happened. Uh, <laughs> I did uh, Ford trucks for a little bit. Um, I did Toyota for a while. Yeah. I don't know. And then, there's actually there's one voice. Do you remember? Uh, uh, I'm not gonna remember. I won't be able to remember the name of the title now. There was a really cool iOS game that was made by Epic, uh, and it was this beautiful like sword fighting game. Um, and they spoke this gibberish. I had the voice of whatever that gibberish was. Well, it's a really interesting story, Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this voice on this one thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's really it's so obscure. I don't even remember. It, so. <laughs> I'm here all day. So. <laughs> uh, there's an animated YouTube series called Grocery Gang. It's just gross out humor. It's aimed at kids. And I played like uh, a character named Gooey. And he doesn't speak, he just like. <laughs> <laughs> just no language. That's all I. It's like they had no direction. They said, What do you want to do? Just as long as it's not words. And I just did a couple of seconds of that. It's like, Yeah, that's great. Just do that. <laughs> Yes! Wow. Acting! <laughs> Genius! Genius! Can you do one more of those? Just kind of go up at the end? Yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> I voiced a slice of bacon. <laughs> For what, Johnny? Uh, Pop Team Epic. Oh! oh. 
Pop Team Epic is really funny. How many of you all have seen Pop Team Epic? Ooh, so the rest of you need to see Pop Team Epic. <laughs> Everyone has been a pop. I, I'm assuming you were in five. I don't know. I mean, if I wasn't in, tell me. Chris, Chris George directed it. Yeah, it, I think everybody's played the main characters at some point. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> I have to make a call. You were in California a lot, and I think he was coming in a lot during that time. But uh, okay, uh, I guess it's your weird. Yeah, okay. it's a weird <laughs> show. Like the episode one, I I played this little girl named uh, this little blonde girl named Popco or something yeah. like that, and uh, and then they go halfway through the episode, and where these two little girls speak with deep men voices, yes. and then they rewind from the beginning, and it's voiced by two women. Like, the same exact show, they just yeah. rewind it. <laughs> and it's like a kind of a tour through all the current Funimation or Gretchen Roll voice actors. It's if you really want to watch it, it's bizarre. Wow. Oh, okay, okay. All right, you're up. All right. Uh, just, first of all, I just want to say thank you for coming to White. It's my first time seeing you guys in the flesh, so kind of started there. Yeah, uh, Anyway, uh, so question's real simple. Uh, Shampa, Vegeta, Gohan, Ichigo, in a four-way free for all fight, who's winning? <laughs> Are there noodles involved? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, They're not winning. Really I, mean, I mean, there's food, and that's the prize. Sorry, guys. Gohan would not win because he's got to go study. Yeah. <laughs> he searched in here. Yeah, Piccolo were there, then Gohan would be fighting, probably. Uh, I don't know, I, who's, who's the last person you mentioned? Ichigo. Never heard of it. Heard of it. <laughs> is that, oh, is, that a, is he a slice of bacon? <laughs> so wait, that does sound delicious. Ichigo, right. Ichigo probably, because he seems very strong. Yes. So crispy. Very intense. Extreme very intense. Crispy. Crispy. Yeah. Yeah. Strawberry flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that lovely question, sir. Hello. Um, so my question is: Would you be? Would um, all of you be able to do one favorite one favorite phrase or saying from any of your characters? Yeah. I, I'm amenable to that. I'm amenable to that. Well, then should we have a meeting and talk about it? Or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do a voice. I've seen you in pictures, but you're way grosser in person. <laughs> yep, you can go ahead that way if you want. Thanks, we've never got that question before. <laughs> <laughs> we have a tall man. Yep, too tall. I just thought he was bound. So, I have a dream of being a voice actor later in Japan. So, would you say it's something that you can start fairly easily, or... Um, how would you go about starting, or would you... In, in Japan? Did you say well, you I'm thinking of starting Japan? here, or like if I can start now, but then, you know, go to Japan and then learn Japanese and do voice acting in that as well. You, well, I mean, it's you not probably a decide which one you want to do. Um, if you want to be a, a voice actor in J Japan, you probably should learn Japanese first. Um, and then I don't know, I did a pretty good job earlier. You just go, Oh, my God, too. Oh, my God, 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 Oh, my Forum is, is a challenge for certain, like to, to make a living at it. Like, we all still struggle from time to time, you know, and even, even with our resumes. Uh, and that is not to dissuade you, but, but that is the reality of the, of the job. The job is not, you know, it's not like getting a job at a company and you suddenly have work for the next 40 years and then you retire. It's, uh, it's a hustle, and it, and it stays consistently a hustle, at least in my experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is distinctly, you want to do this in Japan, it's, it's definitely more challenging, but, but like Johnny said, you know, like, if you're really serious about that, man, I would move and 
start trying to learn Japanese and, and get myself in that culture and, yeah, and then start you know, getting on stage too, yeah. any way yeah. you possibly can yeah, as an actor. Because performance is the most important part of it. It's not the kind of voices you can do. It's how you can emote with just one of your weapons. And that is also a challenge. You know, that's something that it took us years to get yeah. as good as we are now at. And, and we still have room to grow. Uh, you always have room to grow as an artist. But if I were to pick one of those things, I would say learn Japanese first, because once you do that, then you have so many opportunities to do so many other things that you might not actually decide you want to be a voice actor. That's true. Or you can be a translator, you can do all sorts of things, you can be a tour guide or something. Do the things that, like, that, that to me, of all the things you mentioned, sounds like a really good foundation to have in general. So if you want to learn Japanese, do that. The other thing is, the reason I said move to Japan is because by and large, in, in not just my experience, but what I've heard and what I've experienced is that if you want to learn a, a completely different language, the best way possible is full immersion. Because then you don't have an option, you don't have a fallback, you know? You, you find yourself a little apartment, a little job where you can barely speak any Japanese. Over time, you will start to pick things up just naturally. I guess one thing I'll always like ask all, if, we all sat right here. Yeah, just like, I'll just ask an interim no, question no, while we change out the batteries for the mic. It's in my writer. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to the browning and I'm so Oh, proud. I'm sorry. Oh, we were, no, 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's real easy for a CS sidetrack. I'm so sorry. No, not at all. I was just going to ask an interim question while they change the mic. Um, I was just going to ask, what is it like, like, having had started in voiceover where nobody really, like, know, knew who you were to, like, this? <laughs> where you have, like, so many people wanting to ask you questions and who look up to you and recognize you. What kind of, like, that must be so interesting. It's, it's been, uh, I mean, I, 20, 23 years, whatever, how many years ago, I, I did not, I personally did not anticipate this. This was like a, a stand-in, like, you know, I, I, I booked some stuff on, you know, right. in, in anime, and, and I thought of it at the time as, as something that was like a fallback, easier thing to do, and, uh, <laughs> and I had no idea. I, I mean, this is, it's, it continues to be mind-blowing, um, the, the fact that people know this stuff and, um, and appreciate it. It's, uh, yeah, that was, that was not something that I anticipated. I think it was wonderful that we all got to do this before you were actually, there was any hope or any like promise of being recognized for anything. We just did it because it was fun and it was neat, like, like yeah. we enjoyed it and we weren't, uh, at the time when we would, we'd make an episode of Dragon Ball or whatever, show the, the bacon each goes on or whatever, like, <laughs> you'd, you'd make, you'd dub the episode and it, like, it might not even show up on VHS or DVD or wherever it's going to play for like a year. So we didn't, it never felt like we were performing for anyone. We were just trying to make something cool. And I mean, I think Kyle might be the exception because Kyle was one of the few people that came in that really actually, you were kind of an otaku coming in. You were probably yes. one of the earlier otakus. Kyle would come to me and go like, oh, I have, I have all these on VCD. And like, uh, it's like, what the heck is that? So he, Kyle, <laughs> Cal knew more about this than anyone in Funimation, I believe, at that time, so <laughs> it's a different thing. But I, it's still, I never believed you were doing it for, for to be known. No. You were just doing it because you loved it. There's right. passion to, to get to, to play. This, this, this is, is what, it's, uh, what it's really about. And something that I think that, I don't think voice actors will ever get to the level where TMZ and paparazzi are chasing them around. And no, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I actually feel sorry for famous on camera people that it's like, oh, that's yeah, so annoying. I don't feel like I'm Get a cyber truck. That's what it that's what happens to you. <laughs> what kind of car is that? <laughs> Always. Let's move back to the audience. Hello? Oh, sorry. I would just like to thank all of you guys for coming this year. It's just an amazing experience to see all of you guys in person. It's just Thanks, no, I never you. thought I'd get the chance. So I was wondering if I could get um, Marco um, and all of the rest of you guys to say the line, Nah, I win from Jujutsu Kaisen. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, Nah, I win. This was, 
this sounds surprising that, like when people would come to me a long time ago and say, can you say it's over 9,000? <laughs> <laughs> No, I win. <laughs> no. Go ahead, please. Nah, I win. <laughs> is, that, is that the line? Yeah. Sure. And, you're, it, and you cla you're clapping at the... Is it not I win? Oh, yeah. Or I, I had... Or like, I, nah, not now. Oh, nah. 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 Okay. Nah, nah, I win. <laughs> nah, I win. Nah, 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 I think it's a piece of bacon. Oh, it's a sausage. It's bacon. Yeah, I win. That's I win. I've never. We've never gotten that question before. That's the first time we've gotten that question. And I'm telling you, they're going to keep getting it and getting it, and finally, you're going to figure out what it is. Aloha, gentlemen. Aloha! Uh, this question is for you, Chris. Um, obviously, you have a very long story career um, in voice acting, but also on almost equally long resume in voice directing. I wanted to know, how has your working in voice direction impacted the way your performances have evolved? <laughs> it literally taught me how to act, and I'm not joking. Uh, you are so lucky when you get to be a, a voice director, especially in anime, especially at that time. Because I was hired, and I was kind of guessing. I mean, I had, I had done some theater work in, in you know, high school, and I was an opera in college, but it, there was not a lot of real acting training. We were just sort of making it up as we went along. Uh, but then we started getting like really, really seasoned talent, like talented people, and like. Kyle was in kind of that era of people that were coming in, like Laura Bailey and Travis Willingham and, and Kyle and Colleen and Lucy Christian. And I was learning so much just by listening to these people do their work. Um, I didn't learn anything from Johnny, actually. Uh, <laughs> I was like, why not do that? You just yell really loud. Um, I, I, I have to give Johnny credit, actually. He's one of the few people who comes in and he'll scream something for you, and you go, that's great, Johnny. You go, I don't know, man. I think I want to do it again. I'm like, why do you want to do that again? He's like, because I think I can do better. I'm like, all right. And then he'll scream again. I'm like, okay, I think we got it, we got it. He's like, I think I can, I think I can do it again. Like, I like the first one, but if you want to keep yelling, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I think, I feel, I feel like I learned so much of, um, of how to, to act, actually, by watching and observing these other people do some do really creative stuff. Like Colleen is beautiful, and kind of, she's a beautiful lyricist. She has a, like beautiful flow in her lines, and, and Lucy Christian is just transformative. And, and Laura Bailey could do the, these really subtle things with her voice when she'd be like when she'd want to emote something through a sound, where she'd make her voice stutter a little bit. And every like, they just taught me to to trust the actors that come in instead of. Uh, doing what you do when you first start directing, which is, oh my god, if this is not the way I hear it in my head, then it's wrong. But once I started like trusting the actors to do what they do, it was like, I learned so much. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hello there. So I feel that most of us are aware that 99% of animes have a beach episode. <laughs> yeah. So in regards to the beach episodes that take place in Hawaii, and because you're here, do we live up to the hype? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the air is dewy sweet, and I've never had better pineapple in my life. And, uh, he and I were just in the water up to our next, looking down the beach the first day we were here. Really, really freaking tired, and a couple of Mai Tais in, and, uh, yeah, you guys, I, I, I don't feel sorry for you. <laughs> for any of you who had, like, a cool image of what had happened there, uh, to be more accurate, 
I would walk in up to a certain point and I'd be standing on my toes going like, oh god, I don't want to get in too much. It's kind of cold here. And then I'd step in a little bit farther, I'm like, no, it's right here and I don't want to get in any farther. It didn't look as cool as it might have in an anime. There's a, there's a couple body part barricades if the yeah. water's cold enough. I'm sure you guys are familiar. <laughs> and for the men, it's a particular thing. For the women, I'm sure it's another thing. Uh, you know, it starts somewhere. And, and then nipples are the last thing before the shoulders. Where you're like, I don't know. Okay. There was a certain point in the pool where I was found myself getting mad at children for being children. Like, they were splashing. You just jump right in. Like, oh, oh, they splashed me on the back. Oh, God, it was so cold. How terrible. Kids, and I, I, kids I, enjoy themselves. Can I note that's the first time I've said the word nipple on a panel in 23 years. So, we were all here for that. This doesn't come up very often. Well, you made your point. <laughs> that was a double long time. That's a good question. Thank you. I mean, yeah. Yes, good question. Good I, yeah, we uh, concur. Yes. Uh, how's it going, guys? Uh, thank you all for coming out here. Uh, huge fan of pretty much well, all of you guys. Um, actually, my question is for Christopher. Um, you've portrayed these uh, very iconic and motivational moments as uh, characters like All My, Yami, just as examples. Uh, I'm curious, what's your process for preparing for those moments, and uh, what is your favorite moment? I wish I was. I wish I could make up some really cool sounding thing about what I do to get into these things. Like, the the cool thing about working in anime, as opposed to any other type of work that you're going to do in video games or whatever, um, any other type of work is that you get the music and the sound effects in your ear and you get to hear a Japanese performance as a preview before you do it. So in a lot of these cases, and I'm sure I speak for all of us up here, you're so inspired by everything else going on in the show that you just feel lifted by everything else that's happening. For me, I'm very sound oriented, so when I hear music and sound effects and, and action, if I'm lucky enough to be one of the later people to record, I hear all the other people in the episode, um, I don't really have a I don't really have a process, I just try and get a good night's sleep the night before and, and remember to drink at least one cup of water or say something before my first session, which you can't say I always manage to do. Sometimes I'll walk in and they'll, they'll, we'll hear three beeps and I'll go, oh, that was the first thing I've said all day today and that was bad. But yeah, I wish I had something more romantic to say about it, but I'm not, I, I don't really have a lot of methods. Do you guys do method type stuff? That's it. <laughs> I mean, what's your question? They did right, you're right. Oh, I just want to know, what was your favorite moment to do? Oh, my favorite moment? I, I'm still waiting to see what happens in One Piece, because I'm really ah, getting into that right. show. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching it with my kids. It's been one of the best experiences of my whole life, was watching that show with them. Um, I encourage all of you to do it. Uh, because I, no one's watching One Piece. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the United States of Smash was probably the coolest thing. Like, I felt like all, every other anime I'd done before that just felt like it was training for that moment, right? Thank you. Thanks. Hello, uh, you guys, it's obviously have a long resume of, like, uh, shows and TV, but what, uh, do you guys have any favorite roles from early on in your career that no one has really talked to you, talked about or asked you anything about? Yes. Johnny, you've done a lot of stuff that people don't know much about, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one that I can think of is uh, Kiba in Wolf's Rain. See, like three people know that one. <laughs> for over two decades and you hit your IMDB page is like scroll, 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 yeah. scroll. It's like, I don't even remember doing that. Did I, did I do that? And then I'll, I'll have a, a friend of mine tells me, it's like, I wish you got more recognition for the part you did in the Iron Man anime. It was like a bad guy. There's a character named Jensen who basically meets Tony Stark in the first movie and he helps him create the, the, the armor and everything. So they go in a different direction in the anime and he becomes a bad guy. That's like, oh, okay, again, director's thinking outside the box. I got to have a, you know, a lot of fun with that. 
and you know, I don't think the uh, the Marvel anime series did particularly well or were as well regarded. No one ever mentions it, so I don't know. I, I didn't really honestly see a lot of the performance because what we do when we record, we just see the scene and the lines in particular that we're recording. We don't sit there and hit play and just watch everything because time is money. So the director has to basically sum up what's happening in the episode and then we do the thing. But. Uh, it's like, hey, I was glad that I got to do that. I'm glad that a, a friend of mine said, hey, that, that's cool. I mean, we'll make pitching you hold as this type of person, or you do a bunch of bit art voices in the background of this game and all that, but so it was nice to see that. It's like, well, thank you for noticing. That's cool. But there was, I, I'll just drop this here, but there was one show called Ninja Slayer that was so yeah! Did you all know that show? Like, I think some of you may have clapped before you realized that you didn't know that show, but like, <laughs> because I didn't think anyone saw it ever. But it was it was based on this beautiful manga series. Did you do any work on that? I think uh, what's his name, Tyler Walker, I think directed that one. And it was it was based on this gorgeous uh, graphic novel, and everyone thought it was going to be this beautiful series. It ended up just intentionally. <laughs> Looking like garbage, like they, they, all the characters when they would fight, they would just become like, uh, like almost cut out paper dolls that would hit each other. <laughs> and I highly recommend it because it's super bizarre. And any time I, I played the ninja, ninja slayer, and any time he uh, would approach an enemy, he would say, uh, "I'm here to defeat you now. Speak your death haiku." And all of them would make some sort of objection as to how they're not going to die, but it was always in haiku form. <laughs> and then I would beat them and they would explode into real fire. Like, just cut away, it's actually a real explosion. It's a bizarre show. Um, I've got a couple favorites, but, but uh, for the purposes of this particular panel, sitting next to this man right here, there was a show that he directed me on um, called Glass Fleets. Um, and there was a uh, character that I played, who's this really kind of Malcolm McDowell-esque McDowell bad guy, like, like very just slimy and serpentine. Um, but um, I've got a few moments from that recording process that I will never forget. Um, just the collaborative process and how easy and fun it all was, and it just felt like we were making something really cool, that, that harpsichord sequence. Yeah. like. That, anyway, so that one was really cool. My personal favorites are also not super well known. Uh, Darker Than Black is probably my favorite one. Wow, awesome. Uh, closest I've ever come to playing Batman. Uh, and then another one that I like a lot is called Eden of the East. Wow. We're an anime comic, yes. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I've been an actor since I was about seven years old on stage and on screen, and I think that uh, in one way or another, I think most of us started as, as kids uh, in an extent, right? I mean, um, not necessarily in that same way, but in my opinion, that, that, is, the, that is the gateway, like, because you're only getting one of your weapons to communicate the exact same truth you might communicate with your whole body on stage or on the screen, and, and that's actually a challenging thing. Um, yeah, just being really good at, at uh, honestly expressing emotions in a way that seems real uh, is, I think, puts you in a really good spot. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to summarize that. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not doom and gloom, but I just don't know what anime, like what voiceover is going to look like in 10 years. I just don't know. I don't know how much of, like, I, I anticipate a future where we're going to have some video games, and I'm kind of excited to play them, honestly, where a lot of NPCs are AI characters and things like that, and you could create a world where anything could possibly happen. So, and I don't think, that's not going to destroy voice acting as we know it, but it might start, like, carving away at some kind of entry level type stuff that we might have gotten when we were first like breaking in. So I to mirror what Jason said, I'd say like, study performance, like uh, perform for people, because that's one thing that they won't be able to replace for a very, very long time. Uh, because the the 
you know, the AI overlords will be too busy trying to destroy us. They won't be thinking about becoming an actor, right? Like, we'll be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to throw in that I think uh, there, there's a lot of great resources online to learn acting. And you don't have to no longer be, it's like, well, I want an L.A. coach to teach me. I have to be in L.A. Well, now you can be on Zoom. So there's a lots of uh, very talented people from all different cities that can help teach you the basics of becoming the best actor you can. It's not about doing impressions. It's not about being a fan. It's becoming, you know, and learning and honing your skills. And then, you know, ultimately doing a... Uh, a demo that you can then circulate to casting people and networking and join Facebook groups and, and uh, social media discords and all that for, for amateur voice actors and all that and have that support base because eventually you're going to run across opportunities. So, but make sure that when that window of opportunity opens up that you're ready, that you're not just showing up because I'm a fan and I just love this stuff. It's like, well, what can you bring to the table that will make them want to cast you in particular? I mean, any, any opportunity you have, like Chris was saying, uh, performing in any capacity, I mean, every town of a certain size has comedy clubs with open mic nights. I mean, not that that's the way you should go, but any time you can put yourself in that position where you're kind of uncomfortable and you got to be in front of people and you got to talk and you got to communicate something or be creative, like, it's great to, that's like jumping off the high dive. The more you do that, the more comfortable you get doing that. We're not all natural extroverts, you know? Um, some of us have to kind of push that out of ourselves. Doesn't mean you're not good at it. It means that, you know, it's, it's just that initial jump off that high dive is a little more challenging. Thank you. You're very welcome. Really quick, sorry, before we the next question, just as a heads up, we have about 10 minutes left on the panel, so um, also wanted to let you guys know if you want to rapid fire questions, whatever you guys want to do, but um, yeah, just, we may not be able to get through the whole line, just wanted to give you guys a heads up. So short answers to these, right? Yep. <laughs> up to you. As much as you want. Johnny answered all the questions. Uh-oh. Hello, so my question is, how did you guys get into the voice acting industry? Radio. Uh, theater. Uh, prank calling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I did a movie with a Japanese stunt team from Power Rangers, and the uh, audio was... I should have stopped there. That's a good answer. But uh, the, the camera was Japanese, and the audio recording equipment wasn't, and so I think maybe... The frame rate was wrong, so I had to go in and dub myself. And as I was dubbing myself in this film, the producer happened to walk in, heard my voice, and thought I had a decent hero voice, and asked me to come audition for anime. And that's kind of and what was, was that role, Johnny? That was Vash and Trigun. I was starstruck the first time he and I were on a panel together, by the way, uh, because Akira is one of my favorite things that I've ever watched, and I'm the only manga I've read all of them, and anyway, the first time you and I were sitting next to each other, there was a part of my brain that was like, you know what that is, right, dude? You listen to him a lot. You know that, right? Anyway. I never told you that, because I always felt weird to say that. Now that we're now it's not But now that it's not embarrassing at all, I like to work, my friend. Well, thank you. All right, so my question is, in recording Japanese anime, you may have the opportunity to listen to Japanese voice actors' performance. So are, they, are there any Japanese voice actors that you like or respect? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel all the time. I feel like most things I, I work on, I, I always hear something where I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know? um, but I am always thinking about, like, is because we, we, a lot of times in anime, we, uh, we get to hear the yeah. Japanese, you know? And so you go, all right, well, what does that sound like in English, you know? How do I translate that same emotion? You know, it, it's not going to always sound the same or feel the same. And then, and then at the same time, you're thinking, all right, well, I could probably... And sometimes you're like, I could do something like that, or, or how can I improve upon that for an English audience, you know? Uh, but absolutely, I, I hear it all the time. I'm listening to stuff, I'm like, that was cool. 
I mean, the, the Yakuza stuff always sounds cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, right? Most definitely. Yeah. I, as far as like a character that I voiced that I felt like, wow, that guy's awesome. Uh, there's a few, but the one that pops out immediately in my memory is as the actor who voiced the Millennium Earl in um, mm -hmm. D. Gray Man. Yeah. His stuff was like, and I, I didn't do anything close to what he did, but I tried to capture that feeling, that, the depravity that he was expressing with his voice. Um, and at least the director felt that I captured something close to it. But that's all we can do. That, you know, it doesn't translate directly. Um, they're a great guy, though. And clearly, there's some beautiful work being done. Thank you very much. And then my whole follow for being here. My question for you today yeah. is, uh, what are your, what is one of your biggest challenges of dubbing? Getting work consistently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, I, well, the tricky thing is uh, not being distracted while I'm in there. That is like a, a really big problem for me. Like if we have so many like devices and stuff, and something can really you can get a, a text or something that just throws you off. That uh, so trying to keep your emotions out of the the booth can be tricky sometimes. Yeah, if I have a long passage of dialogue to match lip sync to, it's hard for me to memorize. So I'm like. I'm going, I'm basically staring at the script and hoping that my peripheral vision will match. I can just barely see the mouth moving, hoping I can hit that. And it's like, ah, oh, sorry, it costs a little too fast, too slow, let's do it again. I'm like, ah, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, all those things. <laughs> I actually found that like, when people try to too actively watch the mouth movements when they're dubbing, just in my it's not for every, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, people who try to actively watch it end up not, not actually matching it because they're seeing it sort of delayed. They don't realize exactly when they started, so they're trying to slow down or speed up to match the end instead of keeping a natural pace. So, he's not, he's not so you're doing it the right idea, the right way. <laughs> uh, Jason's perfect, though. I, I do memorize, but, but trouble I get in with the memorizing and it's because I've been doing theater since I was a kid and working with companies that made their own work. So we would, you know, basically learn a new script every day. And that does train your brain to, to remember things. Uh, but I'll get distracted because the way I put it is I'm watching the movie. I'm sorry I screwed up. Like, like I won't do one of my cues because I'm like, especially if there are other actors in there, I just start watching it. <laughs> and they're like, and there's silence for a minute. They stop the video and I'm like, they're like, Jason? <laughs> oh, I'm so, oh, yeah, I had three cues. I'm sorry. I, the, the, uh, Chris did really well. I was, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, so that happens sometimes. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. I was wondering how you think uh, fan acceptance or perception of dubs has changed over time, and can I finally admit to my friend that I watch dub anime? <laughs> <laughs> Now, is it, a, is it a purist thing, or is it, I mean, well, because the reason I ask is that Japanese and English, that there's not a direct translation, right? A lot of the reasons that the scripts change, uh, it's not just, uh, it is the fact that it doesn't translate directly, but it's also that um, we have different aesthetics for how it should look in terms of what a cartoon should look like. Uh, culturally, um, I think that, that there's more of a, uh, there's more of an expectation for the for the, the voice to, to look like it's coming out of the mouth perfectly with English speaking cartoons. So a lot of what we have to do is is adjusting to a cultural and translation thing. And none of us make these decisions, like he was saying. Like, uh, so I'm just curious, like those that are are sub purists, it, what is like where does that come from? I don't know. I'm 35 and I've always watched Dub, but you can never tell. I think you're allowed to like Dub, man. Yeah. No, no, no. You don't worry about it. No, no, no. Totally. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Like, like. I don't know. <laughs> what was the? What, I saw a TikTok recently of some some guy going like, "Don't tell me how to watch my manga, like, manga, <laughs> don't tell me how to watch my manga movies or whatever." Like, to, like tell me. I I have a hard time watching some. I I love to watch subtitle content, especially in films, but. I also like to get things done, and so if I, I think we're watching more and more and more content that I'd like to be able to do other things. I'd like to be able to hear what's happening while I'm doing something else. 
instead of staring and reading the whole time. All right. So sorry guys, this is going to be the last question. Oh, oh, sorry. 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 Quickly, thank you guys for making your way up, all the way out to the middle of the ocean. That is the that is Hawaii. Um, just wanted to quickly say uh, this is a bit spot on because it might be a bit hard personally from person to person, but favorite line from your favorite game that you have voice acted. Answer lies in the heart of battle. Oh, God! <laughs> My favorite line is from DMC. Woo! Five, but I'm not going to say it right here because there's kids. <laughs> it's the big F bomb. I just thought it was appropriate. He's fighting his father. It's, it's a good moment. So effing loud, man. So effing dead. I didn't say the uh, Let's see, did, uh, did, any, uh, did any play the game called uh, Stuntman or Stuntman yeah, Ignition? Yeah. yeah, I loved going like, all right, set it up again. Because it was this game of trying to do the same, like drive again and again, and if you failed, I got, as the narrator, I got to tell people they had to do it again. It made me feel really good to know <laughs> I was correcting people's failures, so making them feel awful about themselves. So. Stay positive, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having us, guys. We very much appreciate being here. It was really fun to watch Zorro try and sit in that chair, by the way. <laughs> I've always wondered how like, Zorro ever sits down anywhere. <laughs>